Hey guys, look at this. We've got sun, we've got warmth, we've got one tiny chance of rain in the next 10 day forecast, and we're past our last frost date. So that can only mean one thing. It's time to start direct seeding the vegetable garden for our summer warm season crops. So I'm gonna be planting several things today. I'm gonna be planting a lot of the cucurbits, which is like zucchini, yellow squash. I'm gonna be planting pole beans and I'm gonna be planting carrots. Now in each of these things, I'm going to be giving you useful information in terms of direct sowing anything in the vegetable garden, but also specific information on each of these crops, especially companion plants for these specific things we're planting today. Now, if you want uh, information on companion planting in general, and information on any of these plants other than what I'm planting today. And there's a lot of other plants that we're not planting today that have companion plants. Now, a lot of you know, I wrote this book last year, uh, Companion Planting for Beginners. So I'll leave a link to this down below. It's gonna give you every piece of companion planting information that's science-based for your garden. And I have it out here with me today because I use this as a reference. There's no possible way to remember all of my research that I did a year and a half ago for this book. So this is my reference for my own garden. Now, all the plants we're gonna be putting in today uh, have a few things in common. Number one, they love full sun. Six to eight hours of sun. They also like rich soil, so lots of organic amendment, which these beds have already had done to them. And they like a consistent amount of moisture. Now let's go get to sowing, and I'll give you more specifics on each one. So we're gonna start off today sowing some carrot seeds. And you might wonder why I'm in the onion bed. And that is because onions are a great companion plant for carrots. In fact, any of the alliums, garlic, chives, uh, bulb onions, green onions, any kind of allium creates that scent that we're all aware of. And that scent actually confuses a, a major pest that attacks your carrots. And that is carrot fly. Carrot flies find carrots by smell. So planting them among any type of allium, like these onions, confuses them, and they don't exactly know where to go to find the carrots. So I'm gonna pull off a few of these bottom leaves, and I'm just gonna plant a row of carrots between each row of the onions. Now there is a thought, and I haven't tried it. I am trying it literally as we speak. Keeping these onions trimmed is thought to put more energy into the bulb to get them fatter. So we're gonna see if that'll happen here. In fact, these first several, I'm just gonna go ahead and take off the tops. Uh, I'll just do these first three rows. So we're just gonna work the soil up here between these rows a little bit, making a very shallow furrow. Now we're just gonna sprinkle some fertilizer down each row. I'm using Neptune's Harvest Crab and Lobster and Neptune's Harvest Kelp Meal. You can also use blood meal, bone meal. Just scratch it into the surface. Smooth it out. Now in one row, I'm gonna plant Parisian carrots. And in the other row, I'm gonna plant little fingers. Now, these are short carrots in this bed because all of these beds here are six inches tall and they have wire on the bottom, go for wire. So uh, you can't plant long carrots in these beds because they wouldn't get to grow long enough. Carrots have really small seeds, so we're just gonna kind of twist them between our fingers and move across the row as quickly as possible. Helps to spread them out a little bit. Most likely we'll have to thin them anyway, but maybe less. Make sure you water them thoroughly. Now, if you notice, we did not cover the seeds. We're not gonna cover them with soil. They're such small seeds that they just can't really be covered over. The problem is they need constant moisture to be able to germinate. And that's always the problem, especially with carrots. Now, when you're getting rain every other day, that's fine, but now we're not. Not complaining. So this sun is gonna dry the soil out, especially the surface of the soil, very quickly, probably within a couple of hours. So I used to use cardboard pieces and I would lay them on top of the carrots and weight them down with a couple of rocks or whatever. 
Uh, you can still do that, that's totally fine. But last season I tried something new. I had some shade cloth laying around, and so I just laid shade cloth on top of them. And it really worked well. So I just cut some shade cloth to fit. This is just gonna keep at least 50% of the sun off of the soil. Now, you still might have to water daily. You'll have to come out here and check, just lift it up and make sure it still looks moist. If it doesn't, water it. Just gonna hook these down with some landscape staples. And this will also keep the birds from eating them when they're first new and first coming up. The birds love that. Once the carrots are up, you can remove this. And I'm just gonna water them one more time just to get the cloth wet as well. And that will hold in even more moisture. And that's it. Don't forget to label. Next, we're gonna plant some beans. Now I'm actually planting the variety called Seychelles. It's a green pole bean. And I'm choosing this spot because I have a couple of dill plants in here already. And this dill has been in here for a while. It's been cut back. It's probably gonna start blooming within a month or so. Now, dill is a great companion plant for a lot of things because it attracts lacewings, hoverflies, and ladybugs. Now, they will take care of aphid issues. They will help take care of spider mite issues. Two of the things that beans suffer from the most. So that's why I'm choosing this spot to plant them. Now, they are pole beans, so they're gonna need some support. And you can use anything for support. Um, I use four or five branches, bamboo canes, furring strips, anything you want to use. You want them to be about seven feet tall. The base needs to be at least three feet wide. Then I'm just gonna work some fertilizer, a handful of fertilizer into the ground at the bottom of each of these stakes. And again, I'm using the Neptune's Harvest crab and lobster and kelp meal, um, and you can use blood and bone. I'll be using this for everything we plant today. And then I'm gonna sow two seeds at the bottom of each of these stakes. And we're gonna push them into the ground about an inch deep. And cover them over, firm it down. and water them in well. All right, now it's time to move on to zucchini and yellow squash. And these are some of the most, especially zucchini, some of the most prolific crops you can grow. Now I know what you're thinking. If you have dealt with squash bugs or squash vine borer at any time in the past, uh, you're kind of skeptical. I'm gonna give you a few tips, but I also have a full video on how to combat those, or two videos. I have one on squash bugs and one on squash vine borer. Now, zucchini squash takes up quite a bit of space because as it grows, it becomes this snake-like vine that moves through the bed. Now, all along the vine, you've pulled off the leaves probably because they usually get powdery mildew. So you have this long trunk with a little bit of leaves at the end, and that's where the fruiting happens. So I also have a video, if you have a small space and want to take advantage of, you know, as much space saving ideas as you can, you can grow zucchini squash vertically. So I'm going to put a link to that video down below and you can check that out. So I'm going to plant uh, a couple of zucchini plants here. I'm also going to be growing some up in our cottage garden, which I'm going to plant later. And zucchinis are a good thing to succession sow. So you plant some now, and then maybe in a month or so, plant some again, especially if you have squash vine borer, because you could hit a window where they're not active, and then you'll get a better production that way. So I'm gonna plant two zucchinis per spot, and then I'll thin it just to one once they've come up. Just insurance to make sure they grow. Now, you wanna plant these, if you're not 
going to be growing them vertically, you want to plant them about four feet apart. If you're growing them vertically, you could cut that in half to two feet apart. And then I'm going to plant them about an inch deep. Oh. All right. Now here's what happens if you forget to put fertilizer in before you sow the seeds. Hang on. Now, luckily these aren't shallow seeds or something like carrots, that would be impossible. But I'm just gonna sprinkle a little bit over where I planted them and just scratch it into the surface. Nobody will know. All right, one tag and two sticks. All right, so some more tips on squash vine borer. There is a bit of companion planting you can do uh, a little further away though than normal companion planting. If you grow blue Hubbard squash, just grow one blue Hubbard squash 10 to 15 feet away from the squash you wanna protect. Squash bugs and squash vine borer, for whatever reason, they like blue Hubbard squash better than any other type. And so they're gonna go over there and that's gonna be a trap crop rather than them bothering the squash you want to eat. Now you can also get tulle from a fabric store, T-U-L-L-E. Um, it is very fine mesh. You can also get insect netting, but I think it's more than the tool is. And you can drape these over your, your squash plants before they even come up. So right now, put it on, uh, attach it around the edges with landscape staples, leave it kind of billowy so the plants have room to grow underneath. And unless you have squash vine borer that already burrowed into the ground, their larva, and they're gonna just come out and be under it already, that will physically keep them from your plants. But like I said, I have another video on this that delves way deeper into both of these pests. So I'll link those below. One more companion planting idea. Uh, if you find that you have issues with pollination, and you will know because you'll see baby squash, and you'll think you're gonna get a squash, the flower will bloom on the end of it, the flower will die, and the zucchini will shrivel up and die. Lots of people ask me, what happened to my squash? That is a lack of pollination. If they don't get pollinated, they don't continue to mature and develop. And with our diminishing bee population, that is a problem. So if you have that issue, you want to plant a bunch of daisy type flowers all over your vegetable garden, really, but especially by your squash. And so there could be any type of daisy flower. I love uh, Cosmos, like I already mentioned, and Zinnias. I'm gonna plant Zinnias here, but it's a little cold still right now. So I'm gonna buy Zinnia transplants at the garden center in a couple of weeks and plant those in here. So I'm gonna plant two yellow squash here on the corner of this bed. They don't get as big as zucchini and they're not quite as prolific as zucchini. So I will be planting more of these. And they are planted the same way as the zucchini except I'm remembering the fertilizer. This is Golden Glory is the variety I'm planting. I'm not sure if I mentioned the variety of zucchini, it's called Dunja. So two seeds in each spot. Write out the label so I don't forget. Since there's two, they get their own little straw. So the last thing to talk about is mulch. All of the things I just planted will be mulched once they come up. And you can use just about anything for mulch. Um, I have been using straw for several years. Uh, it does create some weeds, but they're very easy to pull up. So I haven't ever really had an issue with not being able to keep on top of it. The problem is I'm really afraid of bringing Grazon into my uh, garden. And if you don't know what Grazon is, Grazon is a uh, herbicide that has done damage to so many people's gardens recently. Um, it comes in hay, it can come in compost. Anything that was either had Grazon used on it and then is delivered like that, like this, or even after it breaks down, the Grazon still doesn't go away for at least three years. So if you put it on your garden, you either have to remove all the soil or wait three years. And so I have been very hesitant on what I should use because I got this, this straw from a friend. I knew where it came from, but this was the last of it. So we were at the, um, we've had to buy a lot of uh, pine shavings over the winter to keep the chicken's floor dry. If you watch my Next Level Homestead channel, you know I've had a lot of issues with leaking in there. 
And so as I'm spreading it out one day, I realize this is cheaper or no more expensive than straw. And there's absolutely zero risk of grazon contamination. So this year I will be mulching all of my beds with pine shape. And it's great because you don't have to have a farm store nearby. Most pet stores have one to three cubic feet blocks of pine shavings for pet bedding. Now, if you have a farm store, you can probably get it a little bit cheaper there because people buy that in bigger quantities when they have something like a horse stall to fill it with. So we won't have to worry about grazon and we won't have to worry about weeds. So I hope you enjoyed spending a sunny day here out in the garden with me. If you have snow in your area, I hope you enjoyed some of my sun, but your sun is coming soon, I promise. If you enjoyed the video or learned something, please give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. Share it with a gardening friend and I'll see you next time.